She's serving male pattern baldness for the gods. All right, I think it's good. We look good. Good, good. Lighted by a phalanx of tiki torches, we can see a war waged for and against white supremacy, explicitly fought on visual terrain. This series of videos will explore how the alt-right inherits and manipulates some of the rhetoric of enlightenment. Regarding the rise and fall of monuments, censorship of free speech, and the receding jaws of inferior men, three such disciplines concern us. Art history, aesthetics, and anthropology. This first video is about J.J. Winkelmann, the origins of art history, and the new scientific flair with which the reasonable became inseparable from the moral and the beautiful. One man is above all responsible for the whitewashing of antiquity. Johann Joachim Winkelmann. He planted white at the center of European culture for centuries to come. And because she's relevant and she's topical, Winkelmann levies this Greek artistic and political freedom against his contemporaries. In Greece, the wisest man in the city was the most honored and best known. With us, it is the richest. She's got a point. She's an icon. She's a legend, and she is the moment. So now that we've had our good faith fun and paid homage, let's pop that shit. Now come on now. Welcome to Drapetomania, where I make my way unguided and ill-informed through art history, visual culture, and critical theory. J.J. Winkelmann in 1755 set to work on a tome in which he celebrated all the wonderful white marble that he found. Today, we'll look at the significance of his work, its consequences, and theoretical underpinnings. Specifically, we'll see that while the Civil War statue of Robert E. Lee was indeed a racial problem, the problems of antique aesthetics were already racial before there were ever any states to unite. Winkelmann's legacy lives with us today. It is one of the great things that accounts for the way in which we venerate the ancient world. The veneration for buildings like the Parthenon, in its civilization, in its architecture, its law, its government, everything must be indebted to Winkelmann. Outside the academy, Winkelmann's work produced an unrivaled obsession with antiquity. In the years after his death, classically inspired temples and sculptures came to adorn cities around the world. But whole classes don't take to their estates to erect fake ruins on academic rigor alone. Striking this 18th century nerve required some ideological support. There is a great deal of moralizing that lies behind the notion of whiteness and purity. Winkelmann said that we should return to the purest style of the past and that this would make ourselves pure. Over two centuries later, we are still living with the consequences of such an obsession. Winkelmann had pointed the way to a new white utopia. Here he is describing the Apollo Belvedere. Winkelmann thought this was the most beautiful man he had ever seen. There is not the slightest hint of passion that might disturb this harmonious unity of youthful stillness of the soul represented here. This state of calm in which the senses are gathered inwards and withdrawn from any external object permeate the whole stance of this noble figure. The full yet modestly circumscribed mouth spreads emotions without seeming to feel them. I'm giving you 1980s lesbian literary agent, disinterested, pissed off Ellen Barkin fantasy. In fact, just the sight of him got Winkelmann hyperventilating. Such homoerotic musings show an intense concern with self-control, restraint, and dominating one's passions. Very on brand, and a fine sentiment on its own. And now... These people are idiots. The angry children you watch topple statues are truly and utterly stupid. Winkelmann cemented these sculptures as the apex of beauty and the height of human civilization. Clearly, some of us still haven't let that shit go. White supremacist groups such as Identity Europa have been targeting campuses to recruit new members. And if you want to attack your rhetorical enemies, an appeal to the freedom of the past seems to be an evergreen cudgel. Now we used to just call this America, but that's not the reality anymore. Freedom of speech, something there are so many people who really want to destroy. Destroy. Such civility, of course, comes with exceptions. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. Unsurprisingly, associating beauty with political freedom was very useful for a certain North American political experiment. They contracted with the most prominent American sculptor of the day, Horatio Greeno, and he agreed to do a grand statue of Washington in the European style. Lincoln and Horatio Greenow's Washington were both based on ancient sculptor Phidias's Zeus of Olympus. It is uh, 11 feet high, it weighs 12 tons, and it depicts George Washington as Zeus. A certain series of 20th century equestrian monuments testify to how intent we are on riding that hard white rock. 
They were not erected by the generation that survived the war. They were erected a generation later when many of the civil rights laws and civil rights progress was beginning to be reversed. It's like damn near the entire continent is overrun by these displaced alabaster anachronisms. And you thought Vegas was tacky? Even Jordan Peterson, philosopher king of the alt-right and the Kaiser of crustacean metaphor, has his likeness available in a marble bust. Need I remind you, the girls literally killed for a statue. I had to jump out of the way. I seen bodies fly. I'm getting hit by that car. All right. Pause. As you can imagine, videos about 18th century archaeology and our history aren't necessarily as exciting online as white women doing black dances. So. If you want to support me in this work, you can find me on Patreon, on Instagram, on Twitter. You can follow me, give me likes, give me money, whatever you got. Please, donate. Don't be a menace. Give me money, give me money, give me money. All right, chop. A final example. New York's Museum of Natural History, historically under fire for housing the arts of Africa along with dinosaur bones, intended to remove a statue of Theodore Roosevelt. Because of its depiction of African Americans and Native Americans. Tucker Carlson, noted man of the people, and heir to the Swanson fortune, had to speak on it. Swanson International Dinners. German, Chinese, Italian, Mexican style. So please, bear in your mind's eye Tucker TV Dinner Carlson. Brow furrowed, jaw clenched, ulcer impending. Now hear him extol the virtues of America's exceptional Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt's virtues mirrored the values of America. He was physically brave, highly self-disciplined, and amazingly energetic. Now, look behind him. This is happening all over the country. So you're probably thinking right now, sure, but there's nothing wrong with free speech or passion for history or even Carrara Marble. These demagogues for democracy are just misappropriating 18th century archaeology. There's nothing wrong with Winkelmann's kink for antiquity, right? Yes, of course, and absolutely no. One problem is that the sculptors that Pliny names can be traced to the first century, not to an earlier period. Well, the dates were wrong, so there's that. You just need to look at the sculpture, full of dynamism. Serpents are muscular. There's a power here. And all of that energy we associate not with the classical period, but instead with the Hellenistic third or the second century. OK, that's petty. But barring a few inaccuracies, Winkelmann's technique of deep looking still feels relevant today. Appreciating the work, smooth surfaces, numismatic profiles, contours, undulating, uninterrupted, that's not something you can really get wrong. But then there's the celebrated, stony, alien, and eternal whiteness. The ancient world was not like this. When you see white here, you have to imagine vibrant color. So marble was just a canvas that a painter would decorate. So again, wrong. Well, let's just address the white elephant in the room. We know now, and evidence suggests that they may have known then, that the sculptures were not white, but painted. Should look crazy, but that's historical vision happening. A white lie. But a factual wrongness is not something we're interested in. We're talking about ideological baggage right now. And for us, that's where the wrongness becomes very interesting. And why, when all the evidence points the other way, when we know that the ancient Greeks covered their sculptures in color, do most of us still think, secretly, that they should be white? When beginning this project, I was really expecting to find Rikuman making some celebratory statement about white skin. I was going to take the cheap shot, say he was a racist, and be done. But it's not like that. White was my son's favorite color. His feelings as it relates to skin color are all over the place and don't really figure centrally to his analysis of sculpture. He even makes some overtures about people having different preferences for different skin colors and that brown skin might be more supple to the touch or something. So. Do that what you will, but it's not giving dermatological white supremacy, at least in terms of sculpture. That, of course, hasn't stopped anyone in the 19th century from citing marble's beauty as proof of the superiority of white skin. And that's mostly because the history of race is just a whole bunch of retcons. A lot of groups within the alt-right have looked to antiquity as a way of legitimizing what they're saying and what they're doing. It would seem, for Winkelmann, the whiteness of marble was a refusal of any skin, a refusal of flesh itself, and an exaltation of pure form. So Winkelmann's white Apollo is not the white skin of a man, but the undecaying ideal of a god, an abstract universal beauty transcending any man, the perfection of every man. And as we shall see, few things are as white as that. We're honoring all of the great white men who are being smeared and defamed and torn down. It's one thing to see a universal ideal in sculpture, especially in an age of reason where men appear everywhere, blank slates or born free. It is another thing entirely to limit such a universal subject to a minor Mediterranean population with questionable contemporary significance. But that's exactly what Winkelmann did. For Winkelmann, whiteness symbolized all of the great qualities of ancient Greek civilization. It symbolized beauty and health 
and simplicity and restraint and reason. So for us, it's not in the surface level white skin where our problem lies, but deeper in the ideological, aesthetic, anthropological discourse of physical geography. There's this whole debate about the MAOA gene. Black American, you know, black, uh, you know, Africans have. It's like a proclivity to violence that they have. MAOA gene. Yeah. Um, hmm. But basically, kind of white European Asian ancestors, as we kind of moved out of Africa, like aggression and violence was kind of less necessary because we were like farmers and stuff. But right? God, is that really true, though? The 18th century sought scientific explanations for human variety. Consequently, it developed an investment in physical geography, a sort of proto anthropology which attributed human differences to the climate. It. Though this seems to anticipate our own understanding of gene expression, this is nothing like our scientific approach. Well beyond the effects of latitudes on the body, this field of study is suffused with assumptions about intellect, beauty, morality, character, and culture. Absolutely nothing like what we have today. M-A-O-A gene. Yeah. Um, hmm. For Winkelmann, climate was the principal, if not sole cause, for differences in human character and appearance. By the influence of climate, we mean the effects, the diverse situation of the country, the variety of the seasons, and the different forms of nutrition inevitably produced on the form of the body, particularly on the physiognomy and ways of thinking of a people. And the climactic character of the Greek people, not to mention their appearance, is what enabled their art to be so exceptional. And this is art that's not there to flatter the eyes, it's there to stimulate the brain. And this proved to Winkelmann how sophisticated the ancient Greeks really were. And this does figure centrally in his analysis. Remember how I said he covered many cultures over four volumes? Well, those comparisons make Tucker Carlson sound a lot less left field. In his work, Egyptians appear in near constant contraposition to the Greeks. The Greeks are free and creative. The Egyptians are stifled and suffocated by habit. The Greeks are robust and dynamic. The Egyptians are languid and spoiled by the riches of the land. The Greeks are beautiful. Egyptian bodies distorted by custom. This is the basis of their creativity. This is what enables their freedom. This is what makes their art so beautiful. And though claiming such is a bit intellectual, Actually inaccurate. This is a bit racist. I just took a DNA test. Turns out I'm a hundred percent stripped back, restrained, intellectual. I mean, this is really kind. And I mean, like, really, 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 cut, cut, cut. Really, 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 really. Calling these comments racist is inaccurate in as much as race isn't a thing yet. So while the Greeks were cartographically best suited to produce the best art, they only achieved this under certain social conditions. In the 18th century, melanin had yet to make its biological debut. They were still working with this fifth element for humor shit, where it was like four kinds of bile, black, white, red, and yellow, and it made your skin change. Some Aristotle shit that they just extended to kingdom come. And I keep a bad chick around. And around this time, Immanuel Kant was hammering out superficial from fundamental, true racial traits. Turns out, it's none of them. Genetically speaking, race is a thoroughly uninteresting concept. But don't let that stop your fun. Vingelmann didn't. Maybe, between the Egyptians and the Greeks, there's perhaps something specific that conditions this Mediterranean opposition. But this theory of physical geography necessarily associates values with big G geography, involving the entire globe in these social, moral, intellectual, and aesthetic evaluations. Winkelmann's scribblings eventually attracted the attention of the Vatican. So while I can't say it's racist, given Winkelmann's influence, this is a structural and institutional bias. Apollo seemed to have everything. The hair, the attitude, the body. And lest I appear too intellectually generous, making vague gestures toward the consequences of geography, he said some wild racist shit absent the help of any Punnett square. The horizontal eyes of the Chinese are an offense against beauty. Just as the squashed nose of Kalmuks, Chinese, and other peoples is an irregularity, incompatible with the unity of form of the body. And it would be one thing if he focused entirely on sculpture, but this very anatomical snippet was aesthetic, climactic, and ethnic from the man who started it all. I mean, she really goes off. As in the case of Africans, the mouth swollen and raised, such as the Negroes have in common with the monkeys of their country. <laughs> what the fuck? is a superfluous excrescence, a swelling caused by the heat of the climate, as our lips are inflated by heat, a swelling that anger can also produce. 
or by the abundance of bitter humors. A yellow, white, red, brown. And the BBC special that I'm pulling from seems to locate all the racism squarely within the 20th century. But when you compare the nearly pornographic descriptions of the Apollo Belvedere to Winkelmann's disgust for African mouths, his descriptions of their social structures, the geological effects on their art, on their hearts, and their minds, on top of asserting that this Greek ideal was universal, it comes as no surprise that the white supremacists who flock to save these sculptures are named Proud Boys. White people are the best thing that ever happened to the world. It is surprising, though, that all this was missed by the BBC. Pun partially intended. Words spilled from his pen as he swooned over the Belvedere torso and the writhing limbs of the Laocoon. The Laokuan is litty, notesy, is beautiful, and you get a real deep understanding of how the curves work, and honestly, this technique of deep looking really does help you across art forms. I am directing the Department of General Services to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee as soon as possible. Obviously, I like art, so I'm not really mad. Pause. So I'm not saying that Winkelmann's work is entirely worthless, but I am saying that if we're going to act that these sculptures and their deposition is an issue of historical erasure, preservation, or a vision, we should probably acknowledge that history has been carved, hammered, and cast into these sculptures before any rocks were ever quarried. The shit was always a mess, and I, for one, really enjoy the sight of a spray-painted plinth, and all that was just setting the stage. Get into it. The second video will focus on aesthetics, a branch of philosophy dedicated to beauty, which David Hume and Immanuel Kant gave a uniquely racial twist. This undergirds the alt-right obsession with owning the libs with facts and logic. I'm Elizabeth Warren. You just see, this is how you do it. The last video will be about physiognomy, a branch of anthropology dedicated to interpreting human character via fine-tuned skull measurements. This became an obvious racial issue because once you start measuring, ranking soon follows. Tracing the legacies of these disciplines will show us that beneath the mask of facts, feelings dominate. Or as David Hume put it, reason is the slave of passion. All right, chop.